I got held up over there. It's always something, you know? I know, when they, we saw, I was like, oh, it's going to be up on the screen. MJ, how are you? It's a pleasure to see you. That's so smart.
There's the golf course. He's yeah. like the second house there. Oh, he is? Okay. And my other brother lives up, you know, where the fire station is in Elkhorn? Yeah. Right up above oh, really? there. Oh, my mom lives on the saddle between Sun Valley and Elkhorn. Really? Yeah. Then we own a condo right in Fairway 9. Oh, wow. And then my other brother or sister has a house down in well, West Well, I'm going to send you the dates that we're going next year just in case you have to be there. I just put it like that. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's, yeah. I was there the, the week, week before. before. So I had texted... Um, Best friends we have been for there 20 all the years. Time. Yeah. yeah. We haven't yeah. spent our last time at actually Soft Tooth um, uh -huh. Brewery, too, because we end up ending up there with Grumpy's and then Rico's. We, we go there a lot. Of course. Around. Yeah. I love it. I know. So good. Hello, so you. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, yeah, we're waiting for you. Born ready, got it. Ooh, what was the item number we're pulling? 32? I don't know, no one told me. Good morning, and we'll call to order the meeting of the Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada. Ms. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Your first item is to conduct a, your first citizen's participation period. It's the first time set aside for public comment. Those wishing to speak to a posted agenda item, now is your opportunity. Seeing and hearing no one, we'll close this portion of public comment. Your next item, item number two, is to approve the agenda. Your agenda is in order and ready for your approval. However, we would like to pull item number 32 and bring it back to you next month. Motion to approve with changes. A motion on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed. Motion carries. All right. Your first item is we'd like to share some recognition. Um, your next item is your general manager's report, and we would like to share some recognitions with you. First of all, we are going to recognize a mechanic with Keolis. Do we have Mark Villar in the audience with us? 
Do we have Mark? Mark, come on down. Now come on down, Mark. Mark Villar is Keolis' senior bus rapid transit technician with more than a decade of experience working with diesel electric streetcars, which are essentially computers on wheels, and highly technical and complex vehicles to maintain. As with all cutting edge technologies, there were learning curves and technical challenges in maintaining these vehicles. Over the last year, he collaborated with design engineers to develop a replacement hybrid battery system for aged units that were beginning to fail. Mr. Villar altered his work schedule to accommodate the needs of the engineers during their visits to Las Vegas and frequently made trips to California to support the project. His resilience and dedication to finding alternative solutions to intricate problems truly sets him apart. Um, I just want to say thank you to, uh, for, uh, to Keolis for giving me this opportunity to work for them. And also, it was a team effort for the BRT mechanics to get the bus running. And uh, thank you again. Yeah. Did we get our pictures? <laughs> Great. We'd also, this month we're introducing something new as well. Um, in addition to having our contractors nominating operators, security officers and mechanics to be recognized, RTC staff, who a lot of times is out in the field and actually experiencing and interacting with, with drivers, would like to nominate an employee once a quarter as well. And this quarter, we'd like to recognize John Dosher. Is John here? <laughs> John has been an operator for Keolis for 20 years. And Mr. Dosher drives the deuce route. He's a helpful guide and provides outstanding customer service and precise directions to the many tourists who use our system. He shares his knowledge of the various casinos and restaurants along the resort corridor and is a great brand ambassador for the city. Mr. Dozier is retiring in a few months and we thank him for his years of dedicated service and wish him well and all, and all the best in his retirement. Well, I'd like to thank uh, four people in particular. My lovely wife, Jerry, gives me inspiration. She's right there. Jerry, stand. She, hard of hearing. Jerry, stand. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. And Miss Layla next to her who gives me guidance and understanding. Without her, I wouldn't have got through a lot of this. Yay, Layla. Yay, Layla. And my wonderful boss, Francis, for his leadership and his knowledge, who none of us could get through without him. Oh, very nice. And last but not least, one of your own RTC, Ramona, I don't see her here. She gave me challenge and she just kept me on my toes. Aww. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right. Well, you can sit. Our next, because next we'd like to recognize our RTC superstar of the quarter. The staff members from this department created an initiative that uh, challenged each person to help improve overall efficiency. They zeroed in on a number of tasks and managed to reduce the average customer call hold time from two minutes to 13 seconds. It's very big. They reduced the number of abandoned calls by 61%. They handled a 54% increase in paratransit certification calls. Since so many individuals contributed to these impressive improvements, we have many superstars to recognize this time. So please join me in honoring the entire RTC customer care team. Ta -da. The entire RTC customer care team. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, we're trying to Skype them in right now. But you can hear them. is the 
the front line of the RTC. They're working with some of our most fragile constituents, people who really need their help in really planning their lives so that they can live more independently through their services. So thank you so much, guys, for making improvements every step of the way. Oh, yes, guys and gals. Sorry about that. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. There are a lot of conversations right now about smart communities. We hear a lot about smart cities, and yet no one really has a clear definition of what it actually entails. But increasingly, every time I know you go to conferences or conventions as elected officials, inevitably there will be um, some, some track or some presentation related to the concept of tying our collectively starting to aggregate and tie our data together for the sake of operating our municipalities and our infrastructure more efficiently and just being better at what we do, learning to use data to be better stewards of taxpayers' dollars um, in administering all types of different services. The RTC will be closely involved in following this as, a, as the MPO and as the administrators of Southern Nevada Strong, as a regional body in transit and transportation. Um, we will be working closely with each one of your jurisdictions, each one of your entities, to start to collaborate, to figure out what type of data do we currently collect. How can we aggregate that, share that? How can we connect it so that regardless of jurisdictional boundaries, we are a, a, a tighter knit, more efficient community region overall. I'm going to share a video with you that's just, it's, we found it on the internet. It's just kind of a 101, just an overview as to what smart communities could look like. And inevitably, each community will be different, will be our own unique community. We'll figure out what's, what priorities are most important to us, what problems do we need to solve first. And we'll be doing that collaboratively and together as we figure this out. But I will share you with you just kind of this 101 video on smart communities.
gives you kind of an overview of how everything has the ability to be connected as sensors become very prevalent throughout all of our in infrastructure. We've started to have a kind of very organic, um, informal get-togethers with several different agencies in Southern Nevada. So see each one of the jurisdictions here that are represented here, um, as well as LVCBA, Water Authority, GOED, UNLV, UNR, um, we'll be including emergency response so that we can start to figure out what type of data are we all currently collecting and how can we leverage that to make us that much smarter. Yeah, thank you. This is a wonderful presentation. It allows people to kind of have a 101 on what Smart Cities really is all about. And as we're planning for the future, the next 10, 15, 20 years, you know, technology will change how we do business, create efficiencies. and. So I think this is wonderful. It's probably good if we push this information out to local governments as well. So we, if we could get it to maybe even put it on your Facebook page and post it, and we could all share it with our constituents as well. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman and Madam Chair, Co-Chairwoman, um, in response, um, we I know that at the mayoral level, we get, get at least five consultants a week <laughs> trying. This has become the au courant, the, the newest game to get into, to right. make money, be consultants. And I just want to make sure that we're moving in a very structured manner so that we're not working against each other, but somehow almost visually an organizational chart. Because what we do at the city, everything goes through IT when we get all these comments. I'm sure right here you get as many as we get of all these new consultants that started back four or five years ago that we were getting the initial calls. We want to come in and be your Your utopia. We'll create utopia for you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and no, no places like Las Vegas. Right. But I think to get a handle on it early on and create a structure so that in Mesquite they're not doing something that ultimately has to be changed because Boulder City figured out a better way to do it. And so I just encourage, as you go in a smaller group first, at least create a, an intellectual um, organizational chart and then expand it as you get the input because they're out there, they're hungry, they cost money, <laughs> and it can cost us a fortune. We agree. In fact, in our in, we've only had a couple informal meetings so far, but yes, everybody has emphasized that, that we don't want to go with a consultant. Um, in fact, we don't even know that we need <laughs> a consultant. We, we might be able to, we'll, we'll have a lot of conversations about what, what brain power do we have right here, right now, to start to facilitate and, and structure a path moving forward. Well, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, just one more comment, knowing that we're looking in the city at, at concepts of how drones can help us, even though it's not really transportation, and as we look regionally to uh, how can this benefit collaboratively uh, mm -hmm. in the region, not only within our state, but of course, you know, we're tourist-based, so what is that going to do for us with the California, Phoenix, mm -hmm. all of that? So it's just, I mean, this is an enormous, almost to the point, unless you've already done that, that you have one person assigned to be the um, stopgap on this. Yeah, and we might get to that point where we recognize that maybe each agency needs to have that, that one point of contact that is then coordinates with and so if, if we at the city of Las Vegas get a consultant calling that we have this unique thing and we've just done it's great. Who Cares Minneapolis, right. that we know that all we do is forward that so that if Mayor Lee has that same call on his desk, he isn't wasting time and money and his staff time, that we know where to send that consultant. And I love consultant. <laughs> Commissioner. Thank you. Very good points. We have to be more strategic than we generally have, and I like the idea that we don't need to compete with each other. We should really be gathering resources and figuring how we do this. As you build your informational team, I know that in the county, and I'm sure they're hitting the cities too, about the cell phone folks um, mm -hmm. on locating on uh, traffic lights. We probably need to have some of that type of expertise because they're all looking for spots as well, and they're competing with each other. But perhaps we could reach out to Switch or some of those in, in that business, because the issue of sensors is very, very key. And I did not realize we're trying to work with Metro to put some 
new technology to help them out with gunshots and things. And we didn't realize, even in the northest area up the hill, we did not have enough sensor power to be able to draw down the cameras and the equipment that they needed. So that's in urban Las Vegas, let alone our rural areas. And so I think we have to look at the connectivity yeah. of all of that. So where, where are we missing right now so we know where those hot spots are, yeah. so to speak? Um, it, it's, I was talking to Commissioner Kirkpatrick four years ago, I think they changed the law to allow for telemedicine. Mm -hmm. Sensors aren't there, so it does, it's not working. So there's, there's other things that we really should be cognizant of to see if we can see where those gaps, maybe sure. a gap analysis of some sort, and then you start to build your networking so that we're interconnected with each other. So maybe an infrastructure, a mapping of existing infrastructure that we have in place and an inventory of existing. Right, in anticipation of new technology that's going to come in. I mean, I, I, I accidentally finally downloaded music to my phone, but I've been <laughs> trying to do that for a year, and I still don't know what I did, but it worked. Um, <laughs> but so you don't want me, but you want people that have that expertise. And I, yeah. I, I don't know that you need to get to a consultant level yet, but you really, I think we do need to see where are our gaps. It's no different than when we talk about food deserts or we have deserts all over for all sorts of stuff out there. So maybe that's a place to start and then we start looking at the interconnectivity, anticipating parking uh, plug-ins and anticipating autonomous vehicles and you know all those different things that are coming into play. Thank Love you. it. When we yeah. were uh, recently back at the Smart Cities Conference, we heard from the fellow who was the head of the Smart Cities effort nationwide, and he was talking about how important it was to go out and do that needs assessment and, and gap analysis. He said, otherwise, you're going into a community and putting in technology you may not need and may never use, and then you've paid for it. So it's important first step is to go out and do that needs assessment. Yeah. Okay, so this, great, thank you. We'll be coming back to you regularly with updates and, fee, um, and soliciting feedback. Um, we recognize right now probably our role as the RTC, the MPO of Southern Nevada Strong, is to start an educational effort, bring it, maybe host some symposiums, um, bring in some speakers, not consultants, but our peers from other states and, and agencies who are, in, who are building this type of, of infrastructure, this, this type of collaboration, and ask them to share with us um, what's going on. So that way we have the ability to learn um, and kind of get on, all get on the same page as to wh where we want to go. So with that, we will move on to the next agenda item. Oh, yeah, yes. Mayor Lee? Yeah. So following on this intelligent discussion we're having, so as a mayor, am I hearing you say before we do anything, we should use you as a clearinghouse and send people to you as we start talking about regional uh, um, opportunities? I, I, I this? think this Are group, yeah, and as, so I think um, what I'm hearing is we, we need to kind of maybe, we're, we're having organic meetings right now, we need to formalize more as to what this, this group looks like, who are the key people that probably are, are smarter than me personally, Tina Quigley, but the RTC is willing to host and organize and convene these people. But yes, I think okay. that, that potentially it's a very good idea to have the regional, have our regional smart people talking to each other about, is this right for Southern Nevada? Okay. Then. Might, I, like might I comment back to you when you conclude your comments and questions? Yeah, I, I'm just going to announce right now that when I get these calls, I'm going to say we're working with the RTC on a regional plan. You're welcome to do you that. You need and I can to call. Yeah, and I, I can work with Jennifer, Fred Judy, and your somebody, team. somebody, okay? I, that is going to be a great benefit. Isn't that mayor, nice? So it kind of takes you. some of the burden, the really, some of the, that decision-making burden. Like, it, there's just be, there'll be more of a sense of, of calm if we know regionally we're making the right decisions. Yeah, we're not trying to do things to make money off our streetlights as much as protect them, to protect the, the, the asset, and then to move forward to add the connectivity. They always throw, this will make your city so much money. We're not in that for that reason. We're in for what you've just designed. Carolyn, Merrick Goodman, this is a great, great motion. Thank you. Well, I just, if I might, Mr. Chairman, just continue it for one more second because I've seen things go on among the different entities as we go forward and spend some money on something. But in this new industry of IT, it is changing so rapidly. And if any one entity, be it Clark County, um, unincorporated Clark, Clark County, or any of us in the municipalities, begin to work and spend money independently, we are going to really regret it. 
because it is moving so quickly, changing and becoming. I had just had, uh, was uh, briefed yesterday by our public works director and was learning about that now those huge cell towers that I know Councilwoman Tarkanian and my mayor pro tem hated because they look so ugly and they tried to cover them with these phony looking branches that look like a tree. <laughs> well, what's happened now is all those big trees now have become diminutive. And so what it means is, as they reduced in size, much like the original computers probably filled up this room and now we're down to this size, um, they need more density. So if any one of us is spending money, we're just throwing it away unless we're really cautious, understand this, and it's gonna be antiquated. So I just, I can't encourage it enough that there has to be a, a resource or that we don't enter a contract, we the cities or the unincorporated county, unless we've made sure the other uh, municipalities um, and um, RTC, et cetera, are involved and have cleared. Thank you, Chairman. Councilman. Yes, uh, Tina, doesn't this fit kind of into the Southern Nevada strong mm -hmm. framework, mission, objective? It, it does, and that our role is to convene these conversations. And I want to make it really clear, the RTC will never be the deciding entity. It will always be a collaborative. Like this, this is a really big deal, and we will never, ever supersede the city's intent. But we will collaborate and bring those smart people together to make a wise decision for our entire um, community. Thank you, yes. Thank you. Commissioner. Thank you, I was just going to mention that. I think it's a perfect fit for SNS, but I also think then we should maybe have some regular reports to the Regional Planning Coalition too, so that they're up to speed on what we're doing, because there may be some different folks that sit on each of those. I know that I'm chair right now of SNS, but I don't know, I think we're talking about maybe for bringing in a private sector, public, private, public, and, and reversing those, those roles maybe. Um, but I think that that's another regional group that we should probably make sure that we're Would you like us to, to do a presentation to them? I can, we can put yeah. something together. Okay. I, I think that would get with Mario, I think, on that part of it. Okay. And then let's make sure our cities and county managers also are aware of it because sometimes we as electeds forget to go back and report, hey, this is what's going on, just so it's on their radar. Um, you, it would probably be helpful for Do you want, we could um, organize a, to get on each one of your agendas to do just a five minute presentation to Whatever works best. I'm not asking okay. for more work. I'm just saying, you know, if, if it's even at a meal, we brought this up at our meeting. Here's, you know, just here's some of the discussion, just so it's on your radar. There will be this group. Or if you want to do a presentation, that's fine too. I just don't want to make okay. more work for people. No, it's all right. That's our job. I mean, <laughs> it, it, this is our job is to, to educate and make sure that we are keeping everybody informed um, so we never get too far out one way or the other. Thank you. Councilwoman. Um, I was just going to say that. Um, we talked about having the smart cities, and we said the emphasis should be on the users. And the users may vary from government entity to government entity, but what we need to do, I feel, is have a point person at each government entity. So that person then can share the information so we'll all be up to speed, uh, no matter if we're in Boulder City or Las Vegas or someplace in the county. And uh, some of what we use, and then we would have to share the information back so that the RTC would be aware also. I, I just think it's very important. No. Keep the eye on the right. user and make sure that each entity has an understanding of what's happening. Noted. And they know how, I mean, for example, in the city, the mayor knows how it would be best to do it in the city with a point person she might appoint, and then the same with the county. Mm -hmm. And even the mayor here who looks so pretty today. Thank you. <laughs> just, Thank you. Just mayor? one more comment. You know, our residents lead regional lives, right? So, so they're across the valley, whether they're in Hender living in Henderson and working in the city of Las Vegas or in the county, or living in the city of Las Vegas and coming to Henderson to work. So coordinating is so important because it's impacting the quality of their lives in our community. And if I just might add, one of our biggest problems is communication. And so that's why we have to share it, but we have to share it with good communication so that we're all up to, up to speed and so we can keep up with all these uh, consultants. Thank you. <laughs> no despair. There's some really great people out there that are consultants, so no, don't mean to be disparaging. Check your email inbox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
With that, we will move on to our next item, or our next presentation in the general manager's report, and our deputy general manager, MJ Maynard, will provide you a state of the system update Thanks, for Tina. transit. Thank you. As part of our ongoing reporting of our transit system, we'd like to provide you with an update, not only on the state of the system, but also our driver focus groups. So during our last fixed route focus group, drivers asked several questions in regards to the role and procedures of the security officers. It's something that we frequently hear during our meetings because of the uh, large amount of new drivers. So to address their concerns, the RTC initiated the- uh, MJ, could you bring your microphone closer? Oh, sorry, you can hear me now? Uh, have you heard that before? <laughs> okay, so to address the concerns, uh, the RTC we initiated, the development of a continuing education video that our contractors will be able to use as a reference during new driver training sessions to help clarify the role of those security officers. And also during our June paratransit driver focus group, drivers requested that signage be placed in the vehicles as a tool uh, to alert riders of the various policies, such as safety, shared rides, driver treatment, and shopping bag allotment. The collateral will help drivers better communicate with the passengers and enforce the rider policies. Moving on, we're gonna take a look at the year over year stats in our fixed route operations. From fiscal year 2016 to 2017, both our ridership and, and our revenue have decreased, most notably within the resort corridor at more than 10%. Our total ridership has decreased about 2.6% from 65.6 .6 million boardings to 63.9 million. It is worth noting that nationally, ridership has decreased by approximately 4%, with lower gas prices and new competition from ride-sharing ride services as likely the main contributors, while our overall general market ridership dropped by just a half a percent. We've actually seen increased ridership in those corridors where we've invested in additional service and service hours. Revenue was up slightly in the general market, thanks in large part to a robust fare enforcement campaign, which has helped significantly increase valid payments across the system. However, as previously noted, we saw an almost 12% decrease in revenue in the resort corridor, or a decrease of approximately $2.7 million. Overall, uh, the total drop, or decrease, I should say, in revenue was 3.58% uh, from $69.8 million to $67.3 million. And despite lower ridership, we did see an increase in the number of bicycles and wheelchairs we carry each month. On average, uh, we carry about 30,000 wheelchairs and almost 51,000 bikes on our system. As a result of increased service hours over the last year, vehicle miles traveled increased by 5% to almost 21 million miles. Our on-time performance bumped up slightly for the five-minute standard, and considering the amount of detours and road construction, special events, uh, the drivers really did a great job in adhering to that five-minute standard. And we're proud to report that total road calls and heat-related shutdowns dropped significantly, both by more than 30%. We attribute that to our very aggressive fleet replacement program and working closely with our fixed route contractors. In addition, fixed route customer service calls dropped over the last year by just over 12%. The majority of calls that come into our call center tend to be about where is my bus? When's the next bus going to arrive? Uh, with the introduction of our mobile app, customers are able to find their bus in real time, which re really reduces the need for folks to call into our call center. We currently have over 3,400 stops, 1,600 of which include shelters. Of those stops or shelters, 1,136 are located behind the sidewalk. To date, we have spent just over $18 million to move those shelters back, which is fully subsidized by federal grants. And advertising revenue from both bus shelters and buses, which pays for the maintenance of the bus stops, is expected to grow slightly for fiscal 2017 from 3.7 million to 3.8 million dollars. Moving into our paratransit system, from fiscal, fiscal year 2016 to 2017, total trips increased by just over 3% to 1.2 million trips while on-time performance remained at just over 95%. Our paratransit call center, as you heard earlier, experienced a significant increase in calls, um, over 10%, while customer wait times decreased even more significantly during that same period by approximately 15%. 
and more than a 14% increase in call volume and a 16% decrease in wait times for the certification calls. And uh, just a shout out to the management team, uh, Dan Helen, Kenny, and Angela, they did a great job working closely to get those stats where they are today. Uh, we also recently completed the installation of a wife of Wi-Fi in all of our fixed route vehicles, and we are currently averaging 8,900 unique connections to our Wi-Fi. Additionally, since our Ride RTC app launched last September, it's been downloaded more than 68,000 times with more than 100,000 passes sold. So it's been really exciting for us to see the quick adoption by our transit riders of our technology. So now I'd like to hand it over to Scott Gallegos. He's our new manager of safety and security. He's gonna give you an update on his department. Thank you, MJ. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, board members. Um, again, my name is Scott Gallegos. I'm the new safety and security manager for RTC. Um, the last piece of today's state of system report, I will take you through a year over year update on the safety and security of our program. In March 2017, the RTC entered into a renewed agreement with Allied Universal and was able to maintain the $8.4 million uh, security budget. To be proactive, we continue special deployments in and around the concerned, uh, in and around areas of concern based on incident data that include increased security presence uh, at our bus stops to impact passenger and operator safety. We are pleased to report that overall operator assaults uh, by passengers were down by approximately 7.55%. As you can see, from 2016, it was 53 to now 2017 at 49. Uh, it is important to remember that assaults are defined as anything from spitting at the driver, including also the actual physical altercation may require law enforcement presence. RTC fixed route transit passenger on passenger assaults have increased by approximately 6.25%. Uh, I wish I could pinpoint the exact uh, situations, but unfortunately, passenger behavior is very unpredictable. As you see by the slide from 2016, 75 passenger and passenger assaults, slightly up 6.25% again to 80. Under our peer review updates in April 2017, the RTC conducted a review of peer transits. Uh, to evaluate innovation and technologies to enhance passenger safety and security. We conducted a national su survey of agencies with similar characteristics to the RTC, and we received the following responses. The three top technologies that the other transit agencies identified were the See Something, Say Something application, which allows passengers to provide real-time reporting and sus suspicious behavior. Also, upgraded cameras for enhanced video surveillance, and security officer GPS location for improved deployment. With that said, as the RTC is committed to providing a safe and comfortable experience for our customers, moving forward, we are implementing measures to include the See Something, Say Something mobile application that I mentioned before, and an improved officer GPS program at our transit locations to increase officer accountability and improve deployment for overall safety. This will also provide real-time information during incidents and help us allocate security resources in a more efficient manner. Thanks, Scott. <clears throat> Thank you. So I'd now like to introduce Carl Scarborough, RTC Director of Transit Amenities and Technical Equipment to share an update on the Live Tracks video system. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Carl Scarborough, Director of Technical Equipment and Transit Amenities, and I get to show you something cool today, I hope. So, We were asked by the Metropolitan Police Department to look at a way at making the video camera system on our buses accessible to them in the event of an emergency, and we have... Um, worked with our IT department, our contractors, uh, and our vendor on the onboard video camera system to give us the ability to have a live look in. And uh, as you can see, this is a map of the valley. It's showing the bus we're gonna be looking at is our test bus, which is on Charleston. <laughs> and 
and we've got a front door view, uh, mid door. So basically, they can see everything that the cameras are recording. It's just a live stream. It's not an actual video download. Uh, but if there was an emergency going on or a driver pushed an alarm button, uh, they could go right to this and see what's going on and, and determine how to appropriately respond. So this system is, uh, is operated by our contractors, and so we've been working closely with them on this. We've shared this video with uh, the Metropolitan Police Department, and it meets their needs. So we're now uh, finalizing our plan on moving forward and how exactly the hardware is going to work, but um, this, is, this is the project and what we're looking at. And then this is my favorite view. You get to see the bus driving down the street. <laughs> Thank you. And this concludes our report. Yeah. Uh, Carl? Questions, Carl? Carl you Mayor just, Lee. You just piqued my interest for a second. Um, if there is an incident on a bus and you recognize this, you mentioned Metro, but are the local police departments, your first responders, and your people, how does that work? Because I know you have security staff. How does so, that work? So, uh, Keolis and MV, our contractors, will reach out to law enforcement and they'll be able to provide them with a web address and a logon and an ID so that the dispatch or whoever that agency decides is most appropriate can log in and, and see that bus and see what's going on. Uh, and it'll be identified by bus, and they can look at locations, too, to see which bus it is, and if so they're not are, sure. We're the first responders. Yes. The police departments, then your people come in later and relieve our officers. Is that how it works? I've, I'm, I've never, never thought well, of this Well, so they have the um, incident command system that I know just enough about to tell you that if I'm there, when anybody else shows up, they're in charge. So um, law enforcement's always gonna be in charge. It's their responsibility. We're going to give them access to this so that they can have it when they need it. Uh, but it's their incident until they release it. Okay, that answered the question. Thank you, Carl. Okay. Carl, before you go, question to you and council. Uh, as we go live video, are there any uh, legal ramifications as far as videoing? Do we have to put signage up or do we have signage up? Yeah, we have signage up on our vehicles that says uh, audio and video surveillance on the vehicle. That's as far as we've gone. I think as far as we need to go is to, is to have some notice, and that's how we're rolling that out. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. Councilwoman. Backing up a little bit, um, the gentleman before you, where we were talking on passenger on operator assaults. Mr. And Gallegos? It, yes, Mr. Gallegos. Um, and it had gone down. Uh, do you feel any of it, do you feel it might have gone down because of some of the steps we've taken to protect the driver? Because I know that at a time we discussed this at length and we came up with some recommendations and I'm wondering if the recommendations worked. Absolutely, what we've seen industry-wide, but also here as well with the barricades, um, the passengers don't have the access to the operator like they once right. did. Um, also, with the training and customer service, it's not just one thing, but it's an encompassing. Uh, providing that extra training, providing those barricades, providing the uniform security presence, uh, those things have, um, we've seen a trend, it's going down, and with the applications of this new technology that we're using, we can be more smarter, we can be strategic, and we can place those officers in needed spots quicker and more efficiently. Well, that's good then, that uh, we've made some good decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor. Yes, I, I have a question with regards to uh, fares being down on the strip. Um, I wonder, going forward into the future, obviously probably Uber and Lyft technologies have had an impact on us in that respect. And we have the RTC, the Ride RTC technology. I wonder if as we move forward in the future, if there isn't technology for buses that are similar to the Uber Lyft technology with the, w that would then allow someone to not only buy their fare, but find out exactly when the bus is going to meet them at what location so that they could time themselves. Uh, and I know that that takes a little bit of an investment in technology, but perhaps other companies around the country are also looking at this type of technology and maybe we could uh, buy into it. Sure. And um, yeah, this is one of those realms where there's a lot of people, a lot of 
consultants out there, a lot of firms out there, a lot of technology companies who are introducing all types of different improvements, enhancements <coughs> to the concept of mass transit and shared ride and moving people more efficiently using technology from where they are to where they need to go. I can, in the next few years, you will see our conversations here shift tremendously as we start to kind of vet out what really works and, and, and where we want to go. That concludes your general manager's report. Next on your agenda is to receive the Nevada Department of Transportation Director's report, Mr. Rudy Malcolm. Thank you, Tina. Uh, good morning, board members. I wanted to start out with um, the lay of the land with the, the federal appropriations bills. There they're, uh, have been passed by their respective committees in the House and the Senate. There's some reconciliation to take place once they pass the Senate and the full House. But the good news is that um, they're providing more funding than the administration requested. Uh, and they're also, um, at least in the Senate version, funding the, <clears throat> the Tiger Grant program uh, uh, proposed at 550 million and the uh, uh, New Starts program. That's a federal transit administration program that a lot of the RTCs across the nation use for high capacity um, transit projects like uh, bus rapid transit. So hopefully they'll, they'll pass that by the end of the, the current fiscal year and we'll be all set for finally for next year. The new flyover bridge to Boulder City is gonna open up on our phase one of I-11. Uh, we're pleased to have that open uh, early next week. And we just asked uh, the motorists in that area and commuters to just be cautious. There's still a lot of construction going on in that area. Um, still a lot of work to do to, to get that full interchange open uh, near the railroad pass casino there. Uh, but good news is that, that at least we're getting that new bridge and that ramp open to Boulder City, so more direct access. Um, and then also around Labor Day, we're gonna, going to open up the new uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Bridge um, at the, at the, over Charleston Boulevard on Project Neon. And we're, we're planning uh, to have kind of a community event to get out there as pedestrians and, and look at that, uh, get familiar with that before you actually uh, open, we open it up to, to drivers. So they'll get uh, a sense of how it's going to work once it's operational. The, um, there's a, a history down here in Southern Nevada of working closely with our partners and, and funding major projects. And the I-15 star interchange is one example of that with the bulk of the money coming from the RTC and city of Henderson. Uh, that's a, a, a significant new interchange project on I-15 in, in the, the south part of the valley. And the bids open today at 2 p.m. So we're very excited to see, it's about a 40 to $45 million interchange project to see uh, who wins that one, who's a parent low bidder. Um, another big project down here that shows that example of partnership is the, the US 95 widening project up in the Northwest part of the Valley, um, widening from Durango to Kyle Canyon, um, the Elkhorn HOV ramp uh, and Kyle Canyon interchange that's done in partnership with RTC City Las Vegas, uh, using a lot of the local funds from the Regional Flood Control District too. There's a significant portion of, of flood control being added to that with a, the sense of let's pull our funds together and try to minimize the disruption to the, the public and the, the commuters and the visitors in that area of the valley. And that's about an $85 million project that's going to advertise today for several weeks. Um, moving on to selection of of some consultants for the 215 and I-15 North interchange there at the Beltway. Um, we selected Atkins to be the final design. We have to negotiate the contract and, and it's subject to transportation board approval, but that's moving along to get the final design done and eventually move on to construction in future years. Um, CA Group was, was selected for the Tropicana interchange project uh, environmental clearance, which we call NEPA and that, that includes also the Hacienda and Harmon HOV ramps. Uh, so we have to negotiate those contracts, present them to the board, hopefully in September for the board to approve those uh, transportation board. The Garnet Interchange, um, we have a transportation board meeting on Monday, the Garnet Interchange project and widening of US 93. Um, that's the interchange that at I-15 and US 93 called Garnet Interchange, right by the landfill there a lot of truck traffic there, so we're gonna basically re reconstruct that entire interchange 
It's a design build contract. It'll be presented to the transportation board Monday for their approval. Um, but Ames was the, um, the successful design build team leader on that project. It's about a $58 million project. And just for a little history on that project, um, we had submitted this uh, Tiger Grant application for this project back in June of 2015. And, um, and I'm pleased to say that this actually, this often the estimates initially are, are kind of off from the final uh, once you get more design done. This is a design build, so it's not completely designed yet, but the, the bid from Ames was 58 million. This was estimating right about um, 50, I think it was 57 million. So it just, oh, 59 million, I'm sorry. So right in the ballpark, I, I can't believe that we were that good, but <laughs> probably thanks to our consultants. The, um, but good news is that, that it's moving on to that point. And, and just to, to also on the history, we, we actually had the, the special session for, for Faraday back in December of 2015. So I just wanted to, to make that point that we were working on this project and submitted it for a, an application for a federal grant called Tiger. We were unsuccessful, but we're still moving forward with that project. It was added to the, the STIP, the Statewide Transportation Improvement Program on, in February of this year, because it had to advance more to, to have a more definite development and, and more solid numbers to, to program. One of the things I wanted to point out with this project too is that um, there's an opportunity to get money that the states have left, federal money that the states have left on the table. Um, and this is one of those projects that fits the bill because we're actually advancing some of our next year's um, funds in order to deliver this project as a design build project. That means that if we ask for more federal money that's not being used by other states, this is a prime candidate um, because we're, we're using some of our advance, basically using advance funds. So we're able to probably get a, a better position for the department to get some of those federal funds left on the table by other state DOTs. So hopefully we'll be successful and we'll um, be able to announce that at the next uh, RTC board meeting, how successful we are because we, we requested additional funding from the Federal Highway Administration for these, these types of projects. So it's, it's a good opportunity to make up some of the money that uh, Congress rescinded and uh, make us whole again. I also um, wanted to acknowledge that we received uh, a copy of the letter from uh, Clark County Commissioners to the Governor's Office asking for more input on the, the fuel revenue indexing funded projects that NDOT's going to deliver. And just to, to remind um, folks that we, we had submitted a, a preliminary list that wasn't ranked uh, but it was uh, submitted to the RTC in, in mid-2016. Uh, but some of the projects that we see of regional significance um, are the 515-215 Spaghetti Bowl, the City Parkway, Centennial Bowl, Interchange at 215 and 95 in the Northwest. Um, I-11 has to advance through some more environmental, although we're uh, building our Phase 1 and RTC is building Phase 2 uh, south of Henderson to the Arizona border. Uh, we still have to do some more work on I-11 to define where it's going to go in through the Las Vegas Valley. And that environmental clearance will be another significant project we want to look at funding and possibly with FRI funds. Um, obviously, the, the projects that I mentioned, the Trop Hacienda Harmon um, interchange project and HOV ramps is another one that we're advancing through design or through uh, environmental clearance and then eventually have to advance through design and then construction. But uh, uh, these are projects that, that kind of the, the expense of these projects dwarfs the amount of revenue. What I've mentioned to this board and to our transportation board is that we want to see how much money we receive from FRI based uh, on the DMV projections. It's a few million a, a year the first year. And that first deposit goes in uh, in September. So we, we want to kind of have um, a good sense of how much revenue we're going to be taking in. We generally know. Um, ballpark figures, but we want to see how much money is being deposited so that we can eventually put together a bonding plan. And I think that there's, there's definitely an opportunity for the, the local public agencies down here in RTC to, to weigh in on what, what makes sense, what do you support, and it, it's helpful for us to, to get uh, either letters of support for specific projects or resolutions of support, whether from this board or a county commission or, or a city council. Uh, but definitely we, we are open to 
that kind of discussion. So um, we will respond in, to that, that letter from the, the county, but um, we're looking forward to those types of conversations. And that concludes the director's report from NDOT, and I'm ready to answer questions. Thank you, Rudy. Comments or questions? Mayor Woodbury. Thank you. Uh, Rudy, I appreciate you mentioning the I-11 uh, in a couple of aspects there. And I just wanted to express Boulder City's thanks to you and your team for the way that project's gone. You know, it's a real difficult area with the bottleneck there at Railroad Pass. And um, we've had a lot of lane changes, but by and large, it's been without incident. And, um, you know, it's really just been smooth the whole time along. And you know, I appreciate also that you mentioned the RTC as a partner in this. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that this is in two phases. Phase one is a short two mile phase that's right there by the railroad pass and then RTC is doing the 10 mile phase that goes to the, uh, you know, all the way down near Hoover Dam. And uh, it's an important project, obviously, for all of Southern Nevada. It's the first leg that uh, allows that connection from Phoenix to Las Vegas that just really has never been there. It's been a two lane road forever. And when I was a teenager 35 plus years ago, I remember the bottleneck being at Hoover Dam. Oh, yeah. And then when you built the flyover bridge at, at Hoover Dam, it moved up the hill and then now in, into Boulder City and then, and, you know, now it's at Railroad Pass and that bottleneck's been there forever. Uh, hour long waits, I remember sitting on the other side in, in Arizona. Uh, and so this is really important, I think, to, to Southern Nevada. And I don't, you know, people don't see the inner workings of that happening, but as I've watched this go on uh, for the better part of a year and a half now, it's really run very smoothly, and we just want to thank you for everything you. you've done on that. We'll convey that to our project team. Thank you. Commissioner. Thank you. And along those lines, I think you said you're getting ready to do the next environmental part portion yes. of that, and so the arsenic mitigation is still part of that package. The um, naturally occurring asbestos. Right. Or asbestos. Um, I'm sorry. I said arsenic. <laughs> I think we're, we've got... No lace. It was a great movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. Uh, we're actually out of that area, but depending on, uh, I think that it's going to be part of the regular slate of, of environmental issues that we look at. Uh -huh. If it, if we see that it's going through a new alignment and there's geological formations that could have it, it's going to be addressed in the yeah, NEPA document. It, I think you've done a good job of protecting the public as well as the workers, and I yes. think that's a key piece that's there. Um, I have a couple questions, and thank you for acknowledging the letter that Commissioner Kirkpatrick and I sent. Um, and yes, if, if we could put on the record that two county commissioners, <laughs> that wasn't yes. a county letter. No, that it was, was not two, a county letter. Yes. We had asked to um, be a, for local governments to be able to weigh in on priorities of the FRI money from allocations from um, NDOT. So I appreciate that as you get your balance and you know what's there. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that we dictate it. I just think we wanted to make sure that we had some voice in that part of it. Um, I'm, I, I noticed there was a notice in the paper about um, the State Department of Transportation seeking public comments on upcoming projects. So I did go to the Google site. It took a while to find the list, so you might just want to double check the link on that. Okay, okay. so I, I, down, I printed that off. I am not finding anywhere, but maybe it's in, under different numbers, the issue of 95 and Charleston, the, um, the problem of the congestion and the ramps and that part of it, is that in here someplace? I think that's pro that project's already been awarded and it was a construction manager at risk project, so it's under, um, under design right now. Okay. Will so they also then incorporate the um, landscaping? Uh, Tracy and I are going to do a drive around, but I, yes. that was something the constituents asked at our recent meeting. Yes, that would be considered one of our, what we call a capacity project. Capacity improvements have landscape and aesthetics built in automatically as part of our policy. Um, and then, okay, sorry. And yeah. then on your list, where do we find, because I think Part of it is I would least like to wrap my head around the congestion areas that we have all through the valley so that we're really being, doing pro programs that eliminate that or minimize it. It helps with the air quality and all those other factors. So is there a way to tell or do you designate which ones are congestion easing? I'm thinking even uh, in Henderson when I come back from Green Valley and I get on that 215 and you go to Boulder Highway and you have one lane that get on to it, it's insane, it's always backed up. So it's similar to what you're talking about at Railroad Pass. So I'm just trying to think, is there a way to, to tell which of these might help with that? Uh, we generally have 
We've been trying to uh, adopt some congestion performance measures. We've really struggled with that, but we, I've seen maps that show the really congested areas uh, in the valley, and, and they're you know, pretty much where you would expect them to be on the, on the, the high capacity mm -hmm. roads like the, the Beltway and, and the interstate and the, the, and the US routes, the US 95 through the valley. But um, I know that we work closely with, with FAST and uh, to get some of that information that more, more current and more real time. But I'll follow up, Commissioner, and, and see what uh, a better response for you on. on okay, it just would be, I think it would spots. be helpful for us to know where you've pinpointed problem areas. Um, yesterday because definitely, I, I think that we have to look at what's planned and, and what's currently underway, and that's going to change the whole right. nature of transportation and, and relieve some of that congestion that we have now, such as the Project Neon improvements, but they're not going to come online until right. um, mid-2019 when it's completely finished um, in, in phases. But I think that it's a good point to look at where do we need to, to deal to, with uh, that part of it. Because uh, yesterday, I think it was NPR, I was listening to that an excellent article, and maybe it's something we should be put on our radar, is that um, departments of transportation are looking at not only congested areas, well, mostly those because of the um, the impact of the air quality that hits them and the, fa the uh, housing in the nearby surrounding area. And they're recommending that within a quarter mile of those congested areas that local governments require through their building departments that the construction include some kind of air filters um, to protect the health and safety of the, the constituents that live near those within that quarter mile of those congested areas. So I just throw that out there just to put it on your radar. It was an interesting concept um, I'm not trying to add money to things, but if there are ways to um, mitigate problems or health care for folks down the road, that might be something worthwhile to take a look at. So that's why I was talking about the congestion part of it. Um, then I look on page 3 of 18 on the list that I printed off, and it has um, Las Vegas Monorail Company, Mandalay Bay Monorail Extension, $75 million. Where, where did that come from, and why are we paying for a private sector um, since it's a statewide plan and it'll have projects that are submitted by others that are going to be funded by others so it, it's not it's, it might not be clear on that about the funding source but that's anticipated to be funded by the Las Vegas monorail company not, yeah, not by it had hundred percent under local but that has not been approved yet there's issues with regard to right away right. and all that part of it so that's not a presumption just because it's on this list that was just simply a request then yes okay and then, how, how many of these then become shovel-ready type projects? Because we were talking about that just within our own realm of trying to get some of our designs started so that we have some, we can keep people working but also have them in the hopper. Do you delineate that or is it because so many of them you're doing design build you don't necessarily have to do? We it's a good question. We, um, when we had the uh, federal stimulus, we kind of cleared a lot of those yeah. shelf projects that yeah. we had ready to go. And there's, there's a sense that we need to kind of build up that backlog of, of shovel ready projects. Um, so, but it is, um, we have such large needs as far as the construction cost of some of these projects. We're just advancing uh, cer certain ones of those through the environmental clearance phase, as, such as the ones that I mentioned earlier in my report. But uh, it is kind of a t tough to find that balance. Mm -hmm. You want to have these projects ready, especially when there's discussion about the trillion dollars uh, infrastructure program that might come next year through Congress. Um, it's you just have to have some of these things advanced, just just like we were d advancing the, this Garnet <laughs> interchange through the Tiger Grant process. Uh, we've done that for other projects to try to get it ready and get it competitive because um, the, the city parkway off ramp there at, at uh, 515 is another example of one. It's better to just spend some money, get it ready so that if a grant opportunity comes up, you're prepared you're, for you're it. You're more prepared for it. Yes. And then in this whole list, so the, are these just all local government requests to you? Or? No, some of those are, are purely state projects and some are 
partnership projects where we're pulling our money together and some are other entities that are on, on our system. Okay, so wherever the category has state funding, then yep. that's your priorities. Uh, those, it just indicates that that's the funding source. That's the source, not necessarily. Is, where is the rankings that we've spoken about? We often? don't really rank like one through whatever. Um, because of the way that the, the money comes, we want to maintain some flexibility. Um, as I talked about, other states leaving money on the table, the federal. We want to make sure that a, a project's eligible, but we want to be flexible enough to move money around when a project, maybe it's a utility delay and it's, it moves and it's coming out in, in August. Now it's going to be in the next fiscal year just because it bumped three months. Mm -hmm. we, we want to have that flexibility so that we can still deliver that project. And it, it's not a, a big delay to a project, but federally on the program of fe federal program funds, it can be a big hit to lose that funding. So we maintain that flexibility. Um, we'll have state and federal mixed together on, on projects. And uh, we just don't want to prioritize and then um, kind of builds up an expectation if something's uh, delayed due to a utility or property acquisition, we want to just maintain flexibility. Okay, and then uh, just two more, Mr. Chair, I apologize. Um, you mentioned Faraday and I have been the one that's been critical about that moving forward, especially when it's not a project going through and I don't want to hurt North Las Vegas. I absolutely understand that part of it. But when you speak of ranking, originally when I looked at documentation, it was, way down on the list and then got moved up to like third in priority. I use that terminology as a number. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure, just like I'm going to say about whether or not Tropicana Henderson and uh, Hacienda and Harmon are being impacted by the stadium. I want to know which projects really should be either mm -hmm. jointly funded by private sector or are impacted by that in some extent. And, I, and that's hard for me to be able to tell by this document. And so can you comment on that part? Of yeah, so, so one of the things that we do is run a benefit cost analysis, and I saw in this uh, grant application for the Garnet Interchange Project that's associated with that US 93 widening, that was a two to one benefit to cost. But um, a lot of times we look beyond the, the benefit cost ratio to assess whether it should be a priority or not. Sometimes it's a, something that's a bottleneck that it should resu result in a high benefit cost if you eliminate a bottleneck, but um, it's just sometimes it's the last, the final leg of a multi-phase project that might not have as much benefit as a sole project standalone, but as part of a larger series of phases, it, it, it uh, finishes a project off. So I, I think that we're trying to do better, um, trying to look at some software tools to, to have better project selection and ranking and do what if scenarios. Um, so we're just training our people right now on that software tool. It's called Decision Lens, so we can gather that type of information, such as the, your interest about how do you select the mm -hmm. best and be more transparent about it. And, and I appreciate that. So the Trop Hacienda, that one has to do with where the location of the stadium or not? That one is, um, it's was for traffic in that general area of I-15, so it's going to address future traffic growth. Uh, so we had started that one um, as far as identified it as a project need during uh, previous studies, even before the, the stadium Yeah, you had the legs the that had to be moved in that part of it. I remember that conversation yep. under TROP, uh, regardless of whether or not the stadium was there. Right. So I, I, I remember that part. But um, I do think if there's going to be a congestion factor, I want the stadium to succeed if they're going to be here. But I do think that there's some cost sharing that they ought to have an obligation for. So I would hope that as we look at some of the roadways, feeding in and around that, that there's some shared expenses that come into play. I think that there's there's opportunities for that. I know that they've identified some improvements that they're going to do in their traffic study, which is very preliminary, but the you know, yeah, pedestrian bridges. Yeah, I went, I went to the meeting last Thursday, and they talked about the pedestrian bridge. Yep. And somebody brought up, a constituent brought up an excellent point, um, or uh, just a general public person, that maybe they might want to make that a private bridge so they don't have to deal with um, the encampments and everything else that comes into our public sector ones, and I thought that was a very good point to bring up. But that was really the main thing. They didn't really talk about the actual roadway. So I just hope, you know, we stay on top of that and make sure that they're good partners with us because there are some places where they should be sharing in the cost impacts because it's directly impacted by that um, participation. And we do that with other private, private public partnerships, so I, I would hope that we're doing the same thing so that we're not diverting our FRI money for roadway projects that are needed 
for our constituents to get to work safely and so on and so forth, rather than just being sure the people can get to game day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize for taking all that time. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Mayor March. Go ahead, Mayor March. Yes, um, Rudy, I have a question with regards to the I-11 alignment north of uh, Railroad Pass, and I wondered where we were at with regards to that study and if there were any preliminary reports and Will we also be involving local agencies and public input in that process as well? Yes, definitely. We will have uh, public meetings as we develop that project. I think that we're, we're, we're waiting for our traffic study of the Las Vegas Valley to project out 20 years plus the traffic increases on various roads and highways to have that more. Um, I think it's going to have the numbers solid enough to advance the environmental study because that feeds those numbers feed into the environmental study and that will um, we're going to have a, a, a get together with RTC to talk about I-11 and and discuss those types of things about timing and schedule so um, definitely I, I know that uh, Tina and I will present some information to you so that you can be aware of what, well, when we're going to get together. Perhaps uh, the local government public works departments that are impacted or could potentially be impacted by, by the alignments, maybe they should be involved in those discussions as oh, well. Oh, definitely. They, this is very early on, and it's um, definitely will be in partnership with the cities and, and Clark County and, and the RTC as we develop that further, as well as the, the public and, and uh, the business owners and stakeholders in, in the area. Okay, well. I, I just wanted to add something, if I might. Uh, I, uh, going back to what Chris said, I think it's very important that we do keep an eye on the infrastructure and the monies, because we know we need a lot of infrastructure throughout for our citizens. And uh, we also know historically, if you look in other cities, when pro teams came in, uh, all of a sudden there was an additional heavy cost on those cities for infrastructure. Uh, this is a place that they chose, the team chose to have their team play in. And so uh, they knew what the infrastructure problems would be there and what their choices were. And it has to fall, I think, heavily upon them to do that because uh, the monies are needed so much in so many places throughout the state. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, is there anyone else that wishes to speak? Okay, Ms. Quigley, okay. next item. All right. Next on your agenda is your consent agenda, which is made up of items 5 through 41, and I'd like to reiterate that we would like to pull item number 32 and bring it back to you next month. The, your consent agenda may be taken in one motion. Motion to approve with the item number 32 being pulled for the next meeting. There's a motion on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next on your agenda is item number 42, which is to receive a, a report on Southern Nevada Strong and the progress of implementation by the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And uh, Raymond Hess will kick it off. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, Raymond Hess, Director of Planning Services. Um, I'm here to provide the quarterly update on Southern Nevada Strong. And I'm very excited to be joined by Sue DeBella, who is the Interim Executive Director of Community Engagement at UNLV. UNLV will be the uh, partner that we're showcasing this month uh, on all the good work that they're doing. But before we shine the spotlight on Sue, I'd like to take a few moments of your time to talk about some of the things that we've been doing with Southern Nevada Strong. So just as a reminder about what it is we're always up to, we're always looking at uh, quality employment, housing options, quality education, and transportation choices. And our team has been working with organizations across all sectors and all issue areas to advance aspects of the regional plan. We have a team that is out in the community working hard to determine where our offices can lend support or catalyze the implementation of strategy of the plan. And it's not just the work we're doing, we're also trying to use this opportunity to showcase the good work that's being done by other communities as well through our quarterly newsletter, our social media, uh, our website, and other forums as well. So one of the things, uh, you may recall that um, one of our primary objectives as um, the uh, core administrator for Southern Nevada Strong is making sure that we monitor progress of implementation of the plan. 
Uh, and so what we're doing is we're retooling the indicator dashboard. And, and what you have before you, I know it's a lot of numbers, but we just want to show you kind of a sketch of what that will look like. Uh, more importantly, we're adding new metrics into that. Uh, we want to make sure that we're looking at sustainability, housing, unemployment, and education as well. So we're adding new measures that we're tracking across time to see if we're moving the needle to make Southern Nevada stronger. Uh, at the last quarterly update, we mentioned to you that we're work partnering with uh, the Gwynn Center, the Nevada State Grants Office, as well as United Way, uh, to bring together about a dozen nonprofit organizations to come up with a regional grant competitiveness strategy uh, that can hopefully bring more federal grants to this region. Uh, we also engaged about 30 more um, nonprofit organizations in this effort uh, through a workshop. And I'm happy to report that that report is now done and that strategy is now complete uh, and it's already paying dividends. We're seeing a uh, formation of a new professional group of grant writers here in town uh, and then we see uh, expansion of the Nevada State Grants Office as well. Uh, I think they had an augmentation in budget which is exciting uh, and my understanding is that we might even have a coordinator down here in the south uh, to help with some of that. And so we're very much excited about those um, developments and we're going to be working very closely with that. And we want to take this strategy and see if we can apply it to other sectors as well. So that's the work that uh, will continue in the 2016, or I'm sorry, 2017-2018 year. Another thing that we see as one of our core functions is to really hone in on community engagement. As, as Mayor March uh, can attest, you know, that was one of the hallmarks of Southern Nevada Strong in the planning phase. And we want to continue that moving forward. Uh, and so right now we're doing a scan of best practices across the country about what are the tools that we can uh, bring to Southern Nevada to help folks reach the communities that they need to reach, uh, especially with a focus on you know, disenfranchised communities or communities at risk. Uh, and so we've been working with your public information officers, your planning departments as well, to, to ask them what are the tools that you need that can help you do your job better to reach the populations that you need to. Uh, and so some of the things that you see before you are some mapping tools that we're looking at. Um, you may re recall about a year ago or so we brought to you a, a mapping tool for project analysis that looked at congestion and things like that. We're thinking about doing a similar thing that's focused on socio-demographic information. So looking at, you know, where are their populations at risk, how can you target those, and then come up with some strategies uh, that can complement that as well. I'm very excited to announce that we have picked a date for our second annual Southern Nevada Strong Summit. Uh, it's going to be held on October 2nd at the UNLV Thomas and Mack Strip View Pavilion. Uh, beautiful facility and we're very excited to partner with UNLV on this initiative. Um, our keynote is a very exciting keynote. keynote. It is Mick Cornett. He's one of the nation's foremost spokespeople on national municipal issues. Uh, he's, mayor, he's been mayor for 13 years of Oklahoma City uh, and was the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, this past year. Uh, he really has done a phenomenal job in um, regionalism, which is going to be the theme of our, our plan. How can we bring s different stakeholders together to realize a common vision? Uh, and, and Mayor Cornette's going to be able to kind of talk about what they did in Oklahoma City. So that's going to be a very exciting keynote for us. And so this is a great segue to, to turn it over to Sue. Uh, again, we're very excited to partner with UNLV on uh, the uh, Southern Nevada Strong Annual Summit. Um, and they're a great partner for us, and they're doing great work in the community. And so I'd like to let Sue uh, extol some of those, those things that they're working on. Good morning. It's my pleasure to address the Regional Transportation Commission Board today. Many thanks to the commissioners for their good work and support in the community. And many thanks to Southern Nevada Strong for inviting us here today to discuss UNLV community engagement and our collaborations in, uh, on the Southern Nevada Strong project. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge first my colleague, Dr. Sean Gerstenberger, Dean of the School of Community Health Sciences and Acting Dean of the School of Medicine at UNLV. He wishes he could be here today, but is out of town. Uh, he, along with some other visionary folks, joined together to write the first grant to form the Southern Nevada Strong Project with the goal of bringing together the expertise of our university and many other organizations in the community to improve quality of life in Southern Nevada. One of the goals in the Southern Nevada Strong Project is to continue to expand public engagement. And this is the role of my office, the UNLV Office of Community Engagement. It was formed just over a year ago and grew out of the university's top tier initiative, which identified community partnership as one of its five institutional goals. 
At UNLV, community engagement means many things. Helping solve community problems, gaining community support for student achievement and opportunities, building economic development and intellectual and cultural vitality, and those are just a few of our goals. We want to bring the vast expertise of our campus to bear in all of these ways and more, and I should mention that these activities, community engagement activities, are already underway at UNLV and have been for decades in various forms. The job of my office is to facilitate, support, and promote these activities. We serve as a gateway to UNLV to help the community identify and locate the right on-ramp to our campus, and we are building infrastructure to support community engagement in the future. We are also sharing uh, the message of community engagement far and wide. I could expand extensively on the community engagement activities on campus, but I thought that I would highlight a few items today that are pertinent to the Southern Nevada Strong Endeavor. Uh, first, I have the Health for Nevada initiative, very exciting initiative recently funded by the Nevada legislature. This initiative will enable us to hire nine new faculty positions and 20 graduate assistants to work cooperatively in clusters to advance health in Nevada through research, education, and partnership with community entities. Another uh, item that Sean specifically asked me to mention is that uh, his school, the School of Community Health Sciences, uh, works with the Minority Health Coalition to facilitate this group, which is the 60 organizations and agencies interested in providing access to health care and healthy lifestyles in Southern Nevada, such as housing, access to fresh food, transportation, et cetera. Uh, they are providing training and community-based, excuse me, training on community-based participatory research and all the, excuse me, cultural competencies. The next items I have listed here are, are uh, centers and institutes at UNLV. I should mention that there are 52 centers and institutes at UNLV that bring expertise in research, education, policy, and service to the community and beyond. The next three items that I have listed here uh, are among those. The Transportation Research Center, for instance, uh, is housed in our College of Engineering and has managed over 80 sponsored projects funded by several federal, state, and local government agencies, as well as the private sector. In addition, the center has hosted workshops, training sessions, and conferences, all with the mission to promote and conduct transportation research, education, and outreach activities. They study areas such as pedestrian safety, seat belt use, traffic management, engineering issues associated with highways, and they generally promote safety along our roadways. The Nevada Institute for Children's Research and Policy is a not-for-profit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to improving the lives of children through research, advocacy, and other specialized services. They conduct research and report on children's Issues provide information that will advance children's causes in Nevada, collaborate with community groups, educators, and par parents and policymakers to promote a focus on children's issue, issues, and they represent Nevada's children on a nationwide basis to ensure that their interests are addressed. Also, the Center for Academic Enrichment and Outreach. This is a wonderful center that uh, offers a set of programs designed to motivate and support students from disadvantaged backgrounds, including low-income individuals, first-generation college students, and those with disabilities in their pursuit of college degrees. I'm gonna speak briefly now also about the, uh, a research project, and this was the Community Attachment and Quality of Life in Historic West Las Vegas project. Sociology professor Christy Batson led this pro project uh, in partnership with the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority, the Safe Village Initiative, and the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department to better understand community quality of life and neighborhood attachment in Las Vegas' historic West Side neighborhood. Her research project shed light on important issues about public housing policies, community economic development, neighborhood places of significance for residents, and relationships between residents and the police. In the College of Urban Affairs, we have the Nonprofit Community Leadership Initiative, uh, which assists nonprofits, public agencies, and other community stakeholders through the application of university expertise, training, and applied research. And it's located in the historic Fifth Street School to provide easy access to the community. 
I'd also like to touch on briefly also our numerous clinics on campus, and we have clinics in the School of Dental Medicine and the New School of Medicine that provide much needed health care services to the community. And the psychology department offers com a community health, uh, excuse, excuse me, community mental health clinic called the Practice, as does the Center for Individual Couples and Family Counseling. And the Boyd School of Law provides seven legal clinics focusing on such subjects as family justice, immigration, and mediation. I could go on with many more examples of the community engagement activities. There are literally hundreds of them on our campus. And we would be glad to meet with any of you at a later time to talk again about UNLV and these projects. Uh, we are very glad to be a partner with Southern Nevada Strong. And we thank them again for inviting us here today to talk about UNLV and community engagement. We look forward to serving as a host site at the upcoming summit, and we look forward to welcoming you to the campus on that day. Thank you. Thank you. Comments or questions? Commissioner. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that report. I have a couple questions. Um, will you be working with our, our social services department to look at hotspot areas for pop have poverty areas so for example they can do an overlay in a section I just did one um, in the Cambridge area just up the street from you off of Maryland Parkway in Paradise and we found that I had the highest concentration of uh, single parents with children highest concentration of people in apartments and living in poverty highest concentration of women with children under age five that are making less than ten thousand dollars a year yet they have AAs or BAs and that should be reason we should figure out with that talent what happened might be that there's no child care in the neighborhood. Um, so are those types of things that either the Children's Institute, Kids Count, because Kids Count, I, I love it. It's, a, it's one of the best, but we're worse than we have been in some places. Um, so what are we doing to target areas so that we're really putting our resources in a concentrated way? Um, Metro has hotspot areas. They told me that in 50 years, the same eight hotspots have been in town. It's where there's not just, it's crime related, but there's also poverty. Why would we not overlay that, do a gap analysis, do all those things and start going in and concentrating on um, habitability issues? Some of those are the oldest apartment buildings in town. They have window units that cost these people too much money out of their discretionary little bit of funding that they even have. So there's factors out there. And I just don't know, then, you know, maybe we work with complexes to upgrade their their energy so that people aren't paying 300 bucks a month for a $500 a month apartment. I mean, those are types of things. So is that part of what you're gonna be looking at? Raymond, you wanna take that one? Yeah, if I, if I may. Um, so the community engagement toolkit that I mentioned earlier uh, during my part of the presentation uh, will identify some of the things that you just mentioned. So uh, it will look at existing data sets that we can pull into this. Uh, and if folks wanna see what educational attainment is, for example, if people wanna look at you know, how many people per household, median household income, whatever the case may be, they'll be able to kind of sort that information and find that so that you can hone down on certain areas. I already did. So um, contact Donna and social okay. services and she Great. can help you with that as you d identify your areas. Great, yeah, and we want to create an online tool that is available for everybody to use. And then the other thing is we uh, we do want to meet with Metro as well. I think you mentioned this uh, data set, the hot, mm. eight hotspots, uh, and so we're, we're probably going to be reaching out to them really shortly to, to see what data they have that we can pull into this as well that can, you know, again, augment the usability of that. So when we find underserved areas, such as in the, the Kids Count book identifies, do we have funding for that or are we just gonna spend a whole bunch of money on programming and people rather than having anything can actually be changed, implemented, funded, sourced? Yeah, and I don't know, I'm just asking, I have no idea. You like, all control my budget, so uh, <laughs> no, <I'm laughs> to the extent even, you wanna put money towards Even things. from the state, you mentioned some <laughs> grant monies and you got grant writers now and that part of it, if, if you can go into an area and say, okay, we've identified that low income housing, this group is having to spend so much money on X, Y, and Z, are there ways to go to those property managers and say we can help fund changing out that to make it a more livable place? And if not, then that's something we should kind of consider because it does no good just to identify if you don't have ways to be able to make the improvements. Agreed, yeah. I think identification <laughs> of the problem is maybe the first step and then maybe from there when we can assess how big the issue is or how bad the situation is, then we can start formulating, um, you know, coalitions or groups of people, you know, even the co competitive grant strategy that I mentioned earlier, that could come into play as well, that maybe there aren't existing resources here in the community, but there might be federal grants that we can go after. And so this is how some of these different pieces can fit together. 
Okay, because we're working with cooperative ed on a pathway from poverty for a couple areas in my district and Commissioner Kirkpatrick's, and so that's why I brought this up because there's there's some synergy going, but it's like, and granted, we're always stretched for money, but what good does it do to identify a problem if we, and we've known it's been the problem for the problem areas for forever. We're just, I don't want to throw money. I'd rather say this is what's missing and these are the things that we can put into play or let's go find the funding for X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So that, and then we, have a control group that actually monitors your school outcomes, you know, um, parent employment, those types of things so that we're moving people out of poverty rather than just churning and churning and churning. Mm -hmm. If I could just quickly add, um, our, many of our faculty and staff are working with Southern Nevada Strong on some of these housing issues. We're helping to identify some of the issues, bringing our research expertise to bear on some of these things. And going after grant funding, I know, has been a big emphasis for uh, Raymond's group, and we are very committed to that as well, so we're working together on those kinds of things. But agreed on everything you said. It's the funding is necessary okay. to kind of help out. Yeah, it is. I mean, and I would suggest reading the book Evicted if you have not yet. Um, it's excellent uh, read about how we have created poverty through evictions in America. And that may be an area to work on with some of the judges and, how, and constables and other places because I, I didn't even know a record goes with you. Um, and sometimes it's just your, well, anyway, it's, a whole, it's an excellent book. So that would be another one. And then habitability, um, do you all look at any of that in our housing? Do you help, can you assist with determining where properties have just not been maintained and that people are not living in a, in a, a safe, clean environment, especially on the health side of that? Currently, we are not looking in that. But again, if there is a data set out there that we can tap into, that's something, you know, if, if we want to make it available. Um, but no, it's not something that we're actively going on monitoring. No, I think I'll just have to walk it and write addresses down, probably. Yeah. <laughs> you know, cities keep information on code enforcement. Maybe that's a, a source of data. Right. We don't have, yeah, but we don't really have a, we have a habitability statute, but it doesn't even require air conditioning in Southern Nevada. So I'm working on upgrading ours and bringing it to the commission for discussion purposes. But maybe through our building departments, we can find out what do we look for and then what kind of calls for service come in. But unfortunately, I have a feeling it's one that's, it's not really penetrated mm -hmm. um, because when you're poor, you don't even know who to call. Mm -hmm. It's like when I found out that I had for six months people that didn't have hot water in two apartment buildings, mm -hmm. which is shameful. Mm -hmm. And so those are the types of things I'm talking about because that affects their kids, their, their income, their ability to clean up to go to work, all, all those other factors that are there and they didn't even know who to call. They called the press finally. Yeah. So, you know, okay. it really is wonderful that you have a repository of information that it can be kept at Southern Nevada Strong and all of this data can come together where then we find out that, for, for example, that uh, healthy foods or, or the absence of healthy groceries uh, could result in high increase in diabetes with seniors and, and poor school performance. But you learn these things by gathering that data and I think that this is going to be a wonderful uh, source and, and resource for all of us as communities as we make decisions about community and that's where I hope CDBG continues to or, or some source of funding continues to come to local communities from the federal government level. I think that'll be valuable um, and Mr. Chairman, I hope you don't mind that I just spoke. Uh, and, and Sue, I'd like to thank you for, for uh, your public engagement and, and the work that the university is doing as someone who was at UNLV for 15 years, to see the university play a much more meaningful role. You really are working with brilliant minds and academics and students who are available to do research, so you have an opportunity to really put resources to bear for communities and to solve some of these challenges, and it's incumbent upon us to, to uh, tap that. And I think that there's areas that we can engage the university on, including the smart cities conversation and the healthy communities and transportation solutions, as well as social service issues that, that are going on in community, and helping to point out to us when we uh, maybe don't recognize that we have a problem and, and doing the research and bringing that forward. With regards to the uh, summit that's coming up in October, how many folks can be accommodated in that facility and, and can we reach out into our communities and invite a whole bunch of people to, to attend? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, this is an opportunity where we really try to showcase uh, all the work that's being done across the valley related to Southern Nevada Strong. Um, so I, I think we're expecting around 200. That's our target. Last year we had about 150. We're hoping to grow that to about 200 this year. So that's what we're planning for. Uh, I'm sure the capacity of the room is probably a little bit greater than that, but uh, that's that's what we're we're shooting for right now. Maybe we should be pushing this out into our communities and invite all the nonprofits or folks that are involved in issues or even uh, consultants who who would learn about how to do business uh, in a more effective way in our community. So. I'd be willing to help We're push out that information as well. And one last thing, of course, this has been a, and I've talked to the president about this, you really do need to get a planning program, a land use planning program at UNLV. And I, and I know you have many folks who could contribute to that, whether it's the transportation folks or sure. urban affairs folks. Sure. I just think to have uh, folks who are educating future planners in our community, folks who are involved with Southern Nevada Strong or each of our community planning efforts, to have them well educated would be great. So. That would just be my last. Good feedback. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. So you have your homework. So <laughs> you, you've been asked to solve about 60% of our problems. So <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you. Thank you. And next on the agenda is item number 43, which is to receive an update on the uh, our study called On Board, Your Future Transit Plan. And again, Raymond Hasp will walk you through that. Good morning, commissioners, Mr. Chairman. I'm still Raymond Hess, and hopefully I'm still uh, an employee of the RTC. So, <laughs> so far, so, so far, so good. All right, I got the thumbs up. Um, so last time we were here uh, to talk about the high capacity transit plan, I believe it was maybe uh, late last year. Uh, and so today I just want to bring to your attention that this effort has evolved a little bit. Uh, it's now called Onboard Your Future Transit Plan. That's uh, something we're very, very passionate about. We want to make sure that uh, the community as a whole really feels bought into this process because if we try to do this in a vacuum behind closed doors, uh, it's just dead on arrival. And so uh, I'm going to showcase some of the things that we're doing to get out into the community and get feedback. So the first thing I just want to bring to your attention is um, there's going to be a lot of demand on our transportation system uh, between now and out to 2040. Uh, so what you have before you is a map that shows the densities of employment and population. So red shows the highest concentration of where people live or work, and then blue shows also very high levels of where people live and work. But what's important about this map is actually the next sequence, which is looking out to 2040. You see how that intensity and that demand increases over time. So I'll just kind of quickly scroll back and forth between the two, 2015, 2040, 2015, 2040. And you'll just see that, you know, it starts to radiate from the core. You know, in the 2015 uh, situation, you have a lot of red and blue kind of in downtown Las Vegas and around the Las Vegas Strip. Uh, but then in 2040, you see that kind of radiating outward to North Las Vegas, to Henderson, uh, and to some of the suburbs. And so it just really showcases the fact that there are going to be a lot more people coming to this area, both to live and work and visit. And we need to come up with transportation solutions to accommodate, um, you know, the travel demands that they'll have. So what will Onboard do? It's focused on three things. Uh, it is going to address traditional transit, high capacity transit, and emerging technologies. One thing to note on the traditional transit is that this is kind of a new addition to the study. Uh, initially, when we, we brought this study to you, again, you may recall it was specifically focused on high capacity transit. And when I say high capacity transit, I'm talking about kind of that next order magnitude of transit, things like light rail, things like bus rapid transit, things like modern streetcar. Well, based on some initial feedback we got early in the process, they said, you know what? Light rail is great, but if you don't have a great bus system that feeds into it, then it doesn't really serve the, the community's needs. And so we quickly redirected and kind of reformatted the way we're doing things to bring in traditional transit as well. And some of the things that we're going to be focusing on are new routes or extensions to existing routes, more frequent service, and faster service. The thing that we hear from you know, constituents and people in the community about what they really desire from our transit system. On the high capacity transit side, like I said, this is speaking specifically to kind of the, the next evolution of transit with light rail, modern streetcar, bus rapid transit, transit that operates an exclusive right of way. Uh, some of the things that we're doing as part of this study is we're looking at best practices from across the country. So we just got a preliminary draft of um, some of the best practices from Denver, Phoenix, Salt Lake, San Diego, and Orlando. We just got that last week and we're looking that over. Um, we're also going to be looking at where would high capacity make sense in the valley. So what are the corridors where we'd like to see things like light rail? 
Um, and then the other thing that's really exciting about this study is we're not looking at transit in a vacuum. We are actually looking at the adjacent land uses that complement transit. Um, because, you know, I think all of you are aware that there's this direct relationship between transportation and land use, and if we don't look at them in unison, then we're doing ourselves a disservice. And so development opportunities and where things like transit-oriented development could go, where we could densify along corridors to support high-capacity transit, that will be specifically identified as part of this study. And then the third aspect of the study is emerging transit technologies. So one of the things we just want to know, first of all, is you know, what's out there? What, what are some of the things that are influencing demand for transit? What are some of the things that can enhance transit? We want to make sure that uh, we're as progressive as possible in identifying how demand will shift over time. Um, you know, we, our crystal ball is only so clear, so we're going to try to predict out as many things as we possibly can. But at the same time, we want to make sure we put triggers in the plan so that if any of our recommendations become obsolete, we know to reassess those, uh, and that'll be baked into the plan as well. And then ultimately, just knowing what those impacts to our community are when it comes to transit technology and how it can be incorporated into the RTC's operations. So just to give you an idea about the schedule of the project and where we are, it's about an 18-month project. Uh, we started it uh, earlier this year, and we expect it to conclude in summer, fall of next year. Um, there are a lot of moving pieces that all have to fall into place, but so far, so good. We are on schedule. Uh, we're currently between steps one and two, which is you know, identifying the purpose and need and what we're trying to solve for, and then developing alternatives. I'm going to show you a map next, and I you know, don't have a heart attack when I show you the map. It's just the beginning of the process. Then we're going to take that map, evaluate those alternatives, screen them through several different scenario planning exercises, and then ultimately come up with a final plan and recommendations. Okay, so everybody hold your breath. Oh, never mind. It's the slide after this one. So some of the current work currently being uh, done, uh, where we have an existing conditions report where Nelson Nygaard, who's our consultant, and I do have Steve Crosley in the audience. He's one of the project managers from Nelson Nygaard. Uh, he joined me today in case you have any technical questions that I'm not able to answer. Um, but they're doing a lot of the, the foundational work right now. So they've, they've scanned existing plans to make sure that the, what we're coming up with is, is consistent with past plans. Uh, they've done an analysis of existing conditions of our transit system to see how well it's performing and where some of those strong corridors are. Um, we've identified needs, opportunities, and goals. We've started to forecast future transportation and land use demand. Um, and there's also a high capacity transit briefing book, uh, which is available online. It's kind of a, uh, a, a Bible, if you will, that we can use to refer people to uh, explain the concepts of high capacity transit so that we're all talking the same vocabulary. Under community engagement, we are very busy when it comes to community engagement. We have several things that we're doing. Uh, some of you were at our workshop that we had on July 26th, where uh, it was a public workshop. It was publicly noticed. We had uh, just over 80 people attend two different sessions that we had. We got input on um, different areas of the valley that we should be looking at. What are some of the transit priorities we should be looking at? Is it frequency? Is it coverage? Is it, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and then we also asked folks on, you know, what are the things we should be prioritizing when we evaluate these? And so we got a lot of great feedback at that meeting. Uh, we've also, uh, we're hitting the road show, so we've already done at least half a dozen uh, different community presentations, uh, and we have dozens more scheduled. Uh, and uh, we're, we're out there hitting the streets. We also have pop-up events that we've already uh, conducted, and we have more of those scheduled as well. Uh, we have an online uh, survey, which has already generated over 3,000 completed surveys, which is pretty exciting that this early in the process, we already have 3,000 responses to a survey, uh, and that number just continues to grow by the day. Um, we also have a very active website where we're pushing all of our material out so that anybody who wants to get engaged in this process has uh, all the information they need to find out more about it. So here's the part where you're supposed to hold your breath. Um, so one of the things that we did is we, we really asked all of our partners and we, we went out to the community and we said, okay, what are the universe of alternatives we should be looking at? We want everything on the table for consideration that we, we need to look at. Um, now, I, I warn you that I hope that our final plan is not quite this uh, detailed when it comes to how many lines there are, just because that's a pretty robust high capacity transit network. That, that would rival the London Underground. Um, and I don't know if we, we can get there uh, by 2040. Maybe 4040 we could, but maybe not by 2040. So, but this is, this is an important first step. You know, we wanted to get feedback from everybody. Where should we be looking? 
Um, and then we wanted to make sure that nothing was left on the table. And this is not just the corridors, there are also dots on that map that identify major activity centers. So are there you know, major employment centers, major population centers that we need to be looking at as we evaluate high capacity transit? So the next step is really important, and if you'll just entertain me for a moment, I'd like to kind of walk through some of these. Um, this is the, the goals and objectives of the plan, and so ultimately what we want to do is set screening criteria to whittle this map down to something a little bit more manageable, just because there were so many things that were identified on that map. So under enhance, we're talking about making transit more compelling by providing high capacity transit to the highest demand corridors and providing high capacity transit to major activity centers. Under connect, we're talking about improving regional connectivity by connecting residents with jobs, services, and other activities, increasing access to affordable housing, maximizing connections with other parts of our transit system, and providing service to areas with strong pedestrian access. Under GROW, we're talking about encouraging responsible development by providing high capacity transit to areas that can support it, uh, developing high capacity transit that can stimulate transit-oriented development, and supporting community desires. Under COMPETE, we're talking about making Southern Nevada more competitive by providing high capacity transit service that will make Southern Nevada more competitive as a visitor destination, by developing high capacity transit that supports local businesses, and improving Southern Nevada's ability to attract new businesses and workers. And lastly, under SUSTAIN, we're talking about developing sustainable solutions by increasing transit ridership, developing cost-effective implementable solutions, developing a balanced transportation system, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And under each one of those, there's a series of metrics that will go into the analysis process. Uh, we're getting great feedback from uh, all of your staff. We are engaging the planning and public works uh, every other month. We've had several meetings. We've had a set of three meetings or six meetings total, uh, and they've given us great feedback. We just had a meeting last week on maybe some other things that we should be looking at, so my thanks to them. Uh, next steps, I'm very excited to announce today that uh, in partnership with MV, and I want to thank Jim Schultzman and his team for uh, the, the great partnership that they're affording us, uh, we want to uh, have a project bus, uh, and this is a retrofitted, retired 40-foot uh, bus um, that is a literal mobile workshop that we can take out to events, we can take out to public engagements, uh, we'll draw people in, and then we have an opportunity to display materials, show videos, we even have a little kids play center uh, outlined in, in for the plan. I will mention this is just a mock-up, the, the bus is not yet ready, uh, so, you know, just to put Jim's uh, nerves at ease that, you know, this isn't out on the streets rolling yet, uh, but uh, they have a pretty aggressive schedule to get this delivered, which is pretty exciting for us. So, um, so we're really excited to de deploy this. It was pretty successful on Flamingo uh, when you had a project bus, uh, but this has kind of taken it to the next level where we've actually gutted the bus, or MV's gutted the bus, and is actually making it a functional space that we can have uh, community input, garner community input. So that concludes my presentation, and I would be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Questions, Mayor March. Yes, first I wanted to find out if you're getting your license to operate that bus, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I'd like to thank you for a wonderful presentation and for opening up this important conversation. And, and when you first started out, you said uh, you were interested in informing the community as a whole. And so I th I'd like to encourage you to perhaps reach out to all the municipalities and to the county and maybe do a presentation that's a, a community presentation, perhaps at the council meetings, and, and to share that discussion and, and open the conversation, encourage folks to participate, maybe bring your bus along as well, and, um, and just start the, the conversation at each of the communities. Great, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Raymond. Thank you. Our next item is to Mike. receive a presentation on the development of the transportation and business investment business plan. Our next item is item number 44, which is to receive a presentation on the development of the Transportation Investment Business Plan, and Deputy General Manager Dr. Fred Ohini will introduce that item. Thanks, Tina. Uh, Mr. Chairman, every, each quarter we bring a representative from one of the uh, organizers of the TIBP, and we have with us today a representative from Clark County, Ms. Tammy Tiger. Uh, she's also here with uh, Mr. Joe Yasson of Clark County Public Works to give us a brief update on the activities. 
Hi, good morning, Tammy Tiger, Clark County Public Works. I am the uh, department administrator and here to give you an update on the county's projects that are in the transportation investment business plan. As you recall, the TIB focused on this core geographic area and recommended 65 improvements. 17 were in high capacity transit, 20 were in pedestrian, 15 local roadway, eight were freeway, and five were public policy actions. While the county would have input on those recommendations that lie within our jurisdiction and part of the regional effort, the TIB identified 30 of them with Clark County as the lead agency. The recommendations are grouped into seven project suites that are expected to have the greatest impact if implemented together. Starting with this first suite, enhancing visitor mobility between McCarran and the resort corridor, we have what we refer to as the elevated expressway. This project is in the TIBP as the Koval Swenson Express Airport Connector Elevated Couplet. <laughs> now you know why we call it just the elevated expressway. And the immediate next steps were to have the departments of public works and aviation to coordinate on plans, develop alternative designs, conduct traffic analyses and outreach as well as identify funding sources. We were given direction by the Board of County Commissioners to proceed with the pre preliminary engineering evaluation. We collected traffic data from 27 intersections along with travel times. We used that data to develop traffic models to conduct an analysis of existing conditions and then project to 2040 what the conditions would be like if we did nothing at all and then for each of the design alternatives going outbound and inbound. The 2040 projections were based on the travel demands forecasted in the RTC model and with regard to travel times we found that the future conditions modeled an average of 43 percent time savings with any of the outbound designs. Inbound time savings ranged from 40 to 50 percent when compared to the no build condition. All of the proposed designs supported a positive benefit cost to ratio. A look at the design alternatives. Number one is the alignment proposed in the TIBP, which takes traffic from the airport north on Swenson to Paradise with drops down to Tropicana, Harmon, and Flamingo. This is about 3.5 miles of facilities and improvements with an estimated cost of 184 million. Alternative two is 4.8 miles of improvements. It starts heading north on Swenson or Paradise as an alternate alignment, then turns west on Harmon and north of Coval Lane. Design alternative three proposes using Tompkins Avenue to turn west and is also 4.8 miles of facilities. And our final outbound alternative also uses Tompkins Avenue, but instead of Koval, it uses the Howard Hughes Parkway alignment. Uh, now heading into the airport, both design alternatives for inbound use use the Koval Lane alignment. It's a roadway that is already at capacity with traffic volumes. The first design starts with picking up traffic with three entry points from Flamingo and Harmon, continues south over Koval Lane, and then heads east on Tropicana where it drops down to at grade. Alternative two uses Tompkins Avenue instead of Tropicana to turn east to Paradise. As part of our analysis, we also looked at constructing Howard Hughes Parkway south of Flamingo Road. It is listed as the Howard Hughes Parkway extension in the TIBP. We call it the Tropicana Flam Flamingo Connector on our plans. We were given direction to proceed with the feasibility study of this project separately from the elevated expressway. So summary of where we are uh, on this recommendation, we were given direction to proceed with the feasibility study in February 2016. In April this year, we presented our findings to demonstrate the benefits of the proposed system to our board. Last week, we held our first open house to property owners within the project area. And we also have additional presentations planned with the Nevada Resort Association, UNLV. Uh, yesterday, we met with the Convention Authority. And we are receiving uh, a numerous requests from various community groups and businesses. We've also set up a web page on the county website with informational materials and we're tracking and reviewing all of the comments that we receive. We have several projects in suite two to improve pedestrian safety and mobility along the strip. We're kicking off this section with a project on Circus Circus Drive that was substantially completed in May. With this project, we resurfaced the roadway and improved the mid-block pedestrian crossings, including this one in the photo um, right there on the left. This is under the deck, and we installed in-ground flashing LED lights that are pedestrian actuated to help improve safety. 
Another recommendation is to widen the sidewalks to 18 feet along Las Vegas Boulevard. We will continue to work with resort corridor property owners as they improve their frontage. Here's an example um, in front of the Caesars where we worked with them to widen their sidewalks and out front of their property. We will be installing 700 bollards in various locations along Las Vegas Boulevard from Spring Mountain south to Harmon Avenue. They are going in when there, where there are no existing physical barriers. So looking at this exhibit, the areas in green have already have some kind of pedestrian containment like fencing. This project uh, was presented to the Board of County Commissioners in June and we are on track to have uh, the bollards installed by New Year's Eve. There were several pedestrian bridges recommended in the TIBP. We have kicked off design on two so far. One is across, uh, spans Las Vegas Boulevard between the Bellagio and Paris properties. Here's a preliminary design. The other is further south between MGM and Park Avenue where it goes into t the T-Mobile Arena. Um, this is another preliminary design. Uh, on this one in particular, I can point out that we decided not to go with the spanning over the MGM driveway that's parallel to the boulevard. We anticipate constructing the bridges with the same contract in fiscal year 1819, and right now we're estimating those costs to be around 22 million. We also have plans to build pedestrian bridges at these locations. The projects are identified in our current capital improvement program for 2018 to 2022. Their timelines for construction will depend on growth, demand, and development. Moving on to Project Suite 3 and improving our roadways between the convention facilities. We recently completed $6 million in improvements to Convention Center Drive that consisted of narrowed lanes, wider sidewalks, and the addition of LED street lighting. We plan to do the same work on Elvis Presley Boulevard, which is identified as Riviera Boulevard in the TIBP. That project we will work closely again with the Convention Authority and their expansion facility. Coval Reno Giles is uh, now on our current CIP. We plan to resurface the roadway and look at what we can do to improve traffic flow. Coval Lane from Tropicana to Sands, we plan to widen and reconstruct 1.5 miles of Coval Lane, uh, either with the elevated expressway project or um, if that project doesn't go forward, then we would do it on its own. Uh, we'll jump over to Project Suite 5 and improving the core area access around I-15. This project is listed in the TIBP as the Valley View Harmon Connection, which is a lot easier to say what, than what we call it, is the Harmon Valley View Union Pacific Railroad grade separation. When fully completed, it will provide a continuous east-west connection from the Spring Valley area to the Strip. The project has been in design for several years. To date, we have spent over 50 million in right-of-way acquisition. Some preliminary work will be underway in the next couple of months with the relocation of an 84-inch water line. The great separation is designed to connect Harmon and Valley View over the railroad tracks. The Harmon Avenue improvements will help to alleviate congestion on Tropicana and Flamingo to provide an additional backdoor access to the resort corridor. While the Valley View improvements will provide a north-south alternative to I-15. We anticipate starting construction next year right after we complete the waterline relocation. Other TIBP recommendations uh, that not mentioned today will be evaluated upon the uh, demand and growth in our community. So I'm here to uh, answer any general questions you have. Thank I'll you, call Tammy. Mr. Yatsen on technical. Commissioner. Tammy, good job as usual. And I, I always appreciate when you come to our town boards and, and along with Joe, especially when he wore his orange shirt. Do you have it on today? All right, it's the lucky shirt. Um, I actually had printed off the elevated thing. Um, oh, okay. Expressway plans to be discussed during open house. Mm -hmm. um, I've not been a big fan of the elevated concept. I, I think there's other ways to be looking at it, but I do have some concerns regardless on the Koval site we were talking earlier in the flood control meeting about the problems with the flooding through the link and that impact in that area is going to be another factor that i think we're not taking a look at um as you if the elevated doesn't go through i know you've got some widening things we were talking joe about maybe different left turns to ease the burden going into harrah's and sands 
and then with the proposed um, garden or uh, re, uh, re, uh, the Madison Square Garden concept in, in Mr. Adelson's property on the back on Colval, and then there's another new link property they've come around to ta talk to us about. That's going to add huge numbers, and I just don't know where we're really going to get ingress, egress, traffic flow, especially with those stupid monorail blurbs in the middle of the roadway. Um, so what, what are you going to anticipate there? Um, well, uh, you know, we'll have to look at those issues in, in detail on it. On, um, Cause it's congested as you noted already. Correct. So that those other impacts are going to have another. Correct. This, the issue. traffic studies we've done for, for the elevated expressway already shows that Koval is at capacity. Right. So something's going to have to be done there. Um, that's why we're looking at the widening of Koval. Um, but the expressway could be an additional benefit to moving cars in and out of the, re the corridor there. Have we looked at any of the urban light rail concepts with park and rides in addition to the elevated? Or because that was some of the discussion that came up a year ago when we kind of put the committee together to take a look at that. So I think as part of the onboard presentation that Raymond just did, right. um, that'll be part of um, the discussions when we start to get more in detail on the high capacity transit and where, you know, what lines that should run, what roadways that should go on and, and how we're going to move people around in the corridor on that system. And do we, do you have access to knowing how many people come down either Flamingo or Trop to go to back of the house to work at, on the strip? We do have in our traffic analysis, we did have um, our, our consultants look at, at different numbers through all the intersections mm -hmm. in there. And you know, if you guys, if the board would like, we could have a specific presentation done on the elevated expressway, which could get into a little more detail on the traffic numbers. Um, we could come back. And I'm just thinking in general, that. just because of the congestion there, that maybe further east there might be ways to get people out of their cars. I mean, maybe RTC could help with that. Maybe we survey some of your folks that are riding the buses up and down to see. How many are really going? I was told this one time it was 30 some odd percent were actually going to back of the house. But I don't know if that's accurate or not, but we should see if there's a way to help them get out of their cars and not add to that congestion if that's the case. So there may be other alternatives, not just focusing on the elevated concept, but just how people feed in from either west side or east side to that. Yeah, I think, you know, with the projections of. Um residents the, you know, mm -hmm. over the next 20 year, 20, 30 years, and the visitor volume, we're going to have to figure out ways to move people around with all different kinds of modes of transportation. Yeah, multimodal, and I, I appreciate that. Um, so, Tammy, on your slides, mm -hmm. what was the first cost, 400 and some odd million? I apologize. On the expressway? Yeah. Uh, alternative one is 184 million. Two is 214, three is 244, and four is 179 on the outbound. On the inbound, alternative one, which takes Koval, is 134, and alternative two is 143 million. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Mayor March. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I heard you comment about the, the tourism growth in the next. 20 to 30 years, and I'm sure the resort industry has probably weighed in on how many more people are going to be coming to the Strip and through the airport and moving folks along. And, and, and that concerns me. If we're just building a, a, a roadway that carries people into the Strip, that's just more people on the Strip. It doesn't resolve the problem of how do we move people along. And I know as someone who comes into to the Strip from Henderson, I avoid it if I don't have to, because because so often the traffic is so heavy. So how do we get cars off the strip? How can we make it so that we have maybe the, all of the uh, transit solutions on the strip, whether it's the whether it's the buses and the and the Ubers and Lyfts and taxi cabs and all of the mass transit solutions on the strip and somehow figure out how to bring people to the back of the house and, and work with the, the resort industry to try to solve those challenges. Uh, you know, my concern is is that you just can't keep adding more cars and, and if we're growing and we're gonna add the Genting and other properties in the future, it's just gonna become more complicated having more and more cars on the strip and make it more complex and you can, 
you know, you can keep adding more roadway, but it's not going to solve the problem. It's just going to keep adding more people to the to the issue. So, I, and I do think that there are some solutions that are great. I love the idea of widening the walkways to allow people to engage more on the street. And I think that probably it's time for the Howard Hughes Parkway to be a solution in the transit challenges that are uh, serving all of that area. So I, I, I commend you with the many things that you're looking at, but I also think that w maybe it's time to have a, a really serious sit down conversation with the resort properties and say, listen, what, what is the solution for you? Not for today, but we're talking about the next 20, 30 years that, that these are financial solutions for your properties going forward in the future. And, um, you know, you just can't keep adding more cars. All you're going to do is have make it more difficult for people to reach their properties. So that would be just as an observer from the outside looking in that, that I would hope that the resort properties would sit down with the RTC or with the consultants and figure out what the solutions are for the next 20, 30 years. Sure, we have a uh, meeting next week scheduled with the Nevada Resort Association to go over this project with them. <coughs> Commissioner. Thank you, but I think not just these projects, I think, because I know then the TBIP, we even had underground potentially on the strip. You, there's a, there's, um, you can treat it like Denver does. There's different things, and I'm hoping that's part of that conversation, because you're absolutely correct. We have to look futuristically, but we also ought to look at the people on, that come here. Out of the 43 million visitors, the majority of them come from places with multimodal access. Mm -hmm. And if we're just gonna continue looking at sticking more cars on the strip, or on our side streets that impact our constituents getting around to where they need to, or students getting to UNLV, then we got a problem. So I, I'm hoping that we're thinking a little bit more globally, because uh, landscaping can always be replaced. I mean, I know they pay through an SID, and that was, oh, I don't want to lose my landscaping. That's not the issue. The issue really should be how do we do that connectivity? How do we make sure that the tourists that are coming here can easily navigate getting around from restaurant to hotel to Smith Center to downtown medical, whatever it might be. And that ought to be the conversation, not just, oh, we're crowded at this intersection now, let's add another lane. I, I, I think we're going to be But then we also have to deal with flooding issues and before we look at underground. So. Look at that flooding issue. Talk to Stephen Parrish. We talked about it this morning on the, that whole link project and the impact on Cobalt. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Let me uh, highlight uh, some of the things that you are doing. The long-winded over the railroad project uh, critically important and you've done great work accelerating that appreciate it and a priority at the county has always been the pedestrian safety on the strip I mean we're doing we're in year four of the whole pedestrian safety uh, issue so I commend you for that uh, the elevated expressway we've talked about this before it's very easy to have the debate on the editorial pages, but I am very pleased and support where we've gone so far because there's the do nothing alternative, which no one wants, the elevated expressway, which is an option. And I know with the work that's gonna be done over the next few years at the county and the RTC, there will be some options in there. I mean, the presentation today is not a done deal project that's going forward. It's to have real analysis, true numbers provided to the public that are gonna fit into the overall plan. We have the high capacity study going on. We have the on board. It's all part of a bigger picture. And as this board has commented frequently today, it can't be just the county trying to solve the solution. It's regionally, it's the regionalism. So I think what you've done to date is appropriate because if we just sit back and let the, the debate, light rail, BRT, elevated, more lanes happen, we'll be discussing that. We've been discussing it for 10 years. We'll be discussing it for 20 more years. This gives us real data. And if an elevated expressway or adding more lanes is in fact outdated, at least we have real numbers to demonstrate that there's better alternatives. So I support what we're doing. I, I want us to continue to do this because unless we have real analysis, real numbers, real time data, then we'll just debate this forever. And, and we can't afford to as a community. That's what the onboard program is all about. 
It's to try to make some decisions over the next two years as a region that are going to impact us for the next generation. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. We're done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Tammy. Um, Chairman, comments very well stated and taken to heart. Thank you for that. And that brings us to our last or our, our next agenda item, which is item 45. We do not have a need to meet with legal counsel this month, so. If I may, Tina, yeah. and for the board's knowledge, I, I had a conversation during my briefing on this is potential legal, so I think we're okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue, the county had an excellent policy debate a couple weeks ago on advertising with the marijuana industry. And um, there was a clear uh, consensus as far as anything involving federal dollars. We've got to be very careful in dealing with the industry from a marketing advertising standpoint. So I asked staff to check with legal just to make sure because a lot of our RTC funding uh, involves federal dollars if we need a formal policy in place or does the current policy uh, protect us as far as future liability. And I'm not sure we need any answers, but I wanted the board to be aware of that I've asked council to look at that just to bring it back to us if we, if we do have to make some kind of policy decision. Mayor Goodman. Excellent, because um, as you know, the attorney general for this administration was in town recently and I was fortunate to have some time with him and I asked him about the movement of um, substance, a schedule one substance, which creates marijuana still as a felony. And um, he, he was very clear that they're not doing anything with that at this time, which was what former Attorney General Loretta Lynch said to me back in Washington. So um, I think your discussion on it and what you have just uh, suggested is extremely wise. Okay. Council, you can take that as direction, I guess. I, I, I take it as direction and we'll look into that okay. and we've discussed that before. Thank you. Next on your agenda is your final item, item number 46, which is to conduct your final citizens participation period. This is the second time set aside for public comment. Those wishing to speak to the board, now is your opportunity. All right. I did want to comment uh, from some of the comments from the drivers that were awarded today. Uh, we don't recognize our partners as often as perhaps we should, but uh, Tequilas and MB, uh, thank you. You're doing a great job. Uh, those that have sat in these meetings for the past two or three years, the whole dynamic, the whole culture of the partnership and the drivers and, and some of their concerns have been addressed extremely well. From the safety presentation we received today to the driver meetings, uh, to the partnerships that uh, have been offered, uh, we thank you on behalf of the board, we thank you uh, for that partnership because we're only as good as a transit operator as the companies we partner with. Appreciate it. With that soap box opera done, this meeting is adjourned.